Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for The Expanse Season 4, Episode 8, The One-Eyed Man. It was me, it was the one-eyed man! I mean, that's the one-armed man, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> this video is part of a series of videos where I review episodes of The Expanse. I'll have to start with a spoiler warning for The Expanse up to Season 4, Episode 8. If you haven't seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. However, if you have not seen Beyond Episode 8, do not worry. This video will not contain spoilers beyond Season 4, Episode 8. So, uh, this episode... It was really good. I think it, had, it seemed to have a lot of themes to it. It had the theme of lying or doing a despicable thing or something that you know goes against your character or is morally incorrect in order to accomplish the greater good. We had this with Avicerella, who of course did what she needed to do, do leak the photos and played the sympathy card uh, in order to win the election and to get people focused on what's really important. Uh, we've seen uh, with Fred Johnson that he gave up, you know, some belters who died to the inners because uh, working with them for to build a stronger belt and keeping Medina Station was the more important thing to do. And Drummer uh, was not very happy with this. Uh, we see that uh, that uh, El Essie, I think his name is, the dude that Bobby works for is sort of willing to take on a very risky job and do something and go against his morals because he said it was never about selling weapons and as far as he knows it could be but he's willing to do this in order for his big payday so that he can uh leave mars with his family so yeah so that was kind of a running theme uh another running theme i would say would be uh feeling powerless uh, amos of course felt so powerless that he wanted to kill himself uh, everyone trapped there, blind, Murtry, everyone felt very powerless to do anything. Even Holden, who could see, felt powerless to do anything about it. Uh, you had the uh, people stuck on the Baba Bacola, uh felt powerless, uh, you know, to uh, to save their ship. And then you had uh, Avicerella had a bit of a feeling of powerless, too, uh, when that general guy... Um, resigned. I don't know, maybe this is a weaker feat. Uh, Drummer definitely felt really powerless in the face of all these political uh, situations, having to lie and backstab so much so that she resigned. So yeah, I do think that was uh, a recurring theme as well. So anyway, I like this episode. There's a lot to talk about. Um, so first, let's start with Ellis with the death slugs which I was so happy about in the previous episode uh, they weren't quite as scary in this episode but they were a bit like as soon as like and I was right they were only like in the in the corridors I think so if they huddled in that main area they were fairly safe although there were still a couple that that crawled in but for the most part they were okay but they had to make you know make everyone know how important it is not to wander off and of course by this stage everyone's completely blind and Holden's the only one who can see and so they were completely reliant on him for help and when someone wandered off uh they died and so Holden was like, warn me if anyone else wanders off. And we see Amos wandered off, but he kind of wanted to die. He was going right for a wall with like tons of death slugs and he didn't seem to care. Uh, and it was, what I think was a nice touch when we had this belter like just start freaking out and hitting themselves. Uh, because if you're blind, if you go blind, you're not used to being blind. And there's death slugs around you, like if they're on you, that you freak out. I'm surprised more people do that. I would be, like, every thing, little thing, tiny thing that touched me, I'd be, like, freaking the fuck out. That's a death slug! So, uh, I thought that was a nice touch. And, and Holden had to calm him down. Uh, but then, uh, we, f uh, LB finally finds a cure, uh, for the blindness. Uh, where, uh, she realizes that it's Holden's, uh, 
anti-cancer medication. I guess Holden didn't mention this because he didn't think it was relevant, but he's not the scientist here. He's not the doctor. I'm surprised Elvie didn't get on his case more for why the hell didn't you tell me this sooner? Or maybe that's actually something Elvie should have asked him. Maybe she should have noticed, should have asked, hey, are you on any medication? Because maybe uh, the medication might be what's fighting off the Maybe that's on her, actually, for not asking him that. It's like, why didn't you tell me? Because you didn't ask, of course. Uh, <laughs> and then you got Murtry, like, where we get the title of the episode, where he says that uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh, basically, yeah, he doesn't really feel much, you know, have much faith in Holden. And uh, so was, he's put in a rough position where he's work. Uh, uh, you know, he has to put his faith into Holden and he tries to hatch a plan to get his men out and Holden's like, I'm not leaving the Peltish behind. This is, of course, pissing Murtry off even more uh, who he seems to be hatching something. Uh, so that that's, that's all good. That was all interesting. That little talk that Way had with Amos trying to reassure him and they both kind of agree that people like them need to die on their own terms. And plus, like, I gotta mention that moment between Holden and, and Amos, where Amos, like, tried to kill himself, and Holden, like, stopped him, and they ended up embracing, like, that was a really nice moment between these two characters. As I said, th their relationship has really been building throughout the, se throughout the show. Like, in the first season, they were, like, didn't really get along at all. Um... But more and more, and we got a really nice couple of really nice moments in season three, they've been bonding, and Amos sort of uses Holden as his anchor, as his moral compass, because he has, he doesn't have one himself. Uh, so it was really interesting uh, to get that bonding, because we actually don't see them bond on that kind of level before, where, where Holden, like, admits, like, do not die, I need you, I can't do this without you, like, this is a really strong moment, and I think it was, uh, yeah, I think it was well earned, um, yeah, so I, I liked that, I thought it was pretty good, so anyway, uh, <laughs> uh I don't really have much to say about the storyline with the Baba Bacola, it's falling out of orbit, and Amy attached a cable to it to try to you know, pulled out of orbit, and it seems to be successful. That's about it we got there. Um, so going back to Earth, I don't know, that general guy who resigned, I think he's being a bit of a, a moron. He's being a bit of like, oh, you're just doing it for political reasons. I'm like, <sighs> you know, I had to rewatch the previous episode because maybe it was the other general guy and not him. But I was like, hey, weren't you the fucker? that was trying to get Avatar out to blow the whole damn ship up. And so now you're saying that she would just let all these people die for her political reason. You told her, oh, let's blow up the ship. And they're like, and she's the one that said no, that she wanted to have the option uh, for more minimal casualty. And, and, and he has the nerve to get on them. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it wasn't him. Maybe it was the other dude. But he didn't, he didn't object to it when the other dude said it if it was in fact the other dude so I still wouldn't give him a pass even if it it wasn't uh so yeah so I thought he was kind of uh had no leg to stand on I thought and I, I was like oh yeah oh he's gonna resign I would have been like Elvis Rale too it's like yeah get the fuck out of my office go ahead don't let the door hit you your ass on the way out but anyway, uh, then we had that, that moment that felt like the human moment where Avasara had this written speech at the memorial and she decided to give, uh, fuck it, I'm going completely off book and I'm going to uh, like speak from the heart, uh, which was a nice touching moment until you learn that was all a calculated political move as well. Uh, because apparently she had leaked the photos of New Terra or Illus that show how dangerous it is uh, to the media, and once the media gets a hold of them, this destroys Nancy Gal's narrative, and it kind of proves that Alvis Sorrell was right all along. And I still do not like this actor who plays Arjun. I still don't. I still think it would be better with the older actor. Uh, I mean, the other one. Uh, this, I just don't know that. But I did really like the scene where he confronted Avasarella uh, about it, and 
and was really upset and angry because she saw the the how she manipulated the political situation. But I kind of get her perspectives like you're the one that's telling me I gotta play these political games and you don't get to complain this is because I didn't play by your rules I mean I completely side with her and I think that she was right I mean I I don't think it was that morally compromising to leak these uh, pictures now it was maybe a bit uh, cold calculated to have that emotional uh, speech that would just turn out to be a political maneuver, I can see why Arjun would be upset with that, particularly the part where he said that you used our dead son for your political gain, uh, which is kind of low, but um, she said, everything I said, I, it was the truth. But I don't think that's what the problem is. The problem is how she used that. She used that truth for to manipulate people for political gain. Uh, so I can see the issue there. But as far as leaking the photos go, I kind of don't say anything wrong with that because it does, how she says it, gets people's focus back on what's important, new terrorists. So now I'm changing my vote to, to Alva Sorella. <laughs> because earlier I said I'd vote for Nancy Gow. Now she's convinced me with those photos. And I can see how some people are not very happy with her storyline this season, saying that it's kind of compromising her character because she was shown as this badass that you cheer for in earlier seasons. This season, she's a lot more gray. You don't really cheer for her that much, but I like it. I don't mind it at all. I loved her as the badass you could cheer for, don't get me wrong, but I like this exploring her character, her, this grayness of her not always being like the perfect bastion of good That because she is a good politician and it's showing the uh, reality of politics um, in a way that I think is really smart uh, and really and so like a lot of characters as I said theme of the episode people are having to do morally compromising things for the greater good and I always think find that very fascinating storytelling um, so anyway we finally get Fred Johnson back uh, I wonder if this actor doesn't is not really available that much anymore because barely <laughs> barely appears. He's always just name dropped. Although I did remember hearing that he would appear in this season. I kind of forgot about that until I saw him. He's got he's sporting some dreadlocks now, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was cool to see him and uh, how I love. When he's like, you know, oh, hi, how's you doing? Shaking hands with Ashford. And then Drummer just like pushes him aside and punches him in the face. <laughs> oh, that, that was really true to the uh, Fred Johnson and Drummer relationship. And you know what? This is another situation where I see Fred Johnson's point. I see why he's saying that, again, he's being a political creature as well. That if the OPA were the ones to board the ship, then they would, it would support Marco's claim, but now instead, Earth looks bad. But although, as Drummer points out, uh, she's allowing, he's allowing that maneuver, allow more people to go to Marco's side, because he has that video out of the Bolter's last moments. Although, like, I don't know how they could have that video as a calling card for how the Belters are being oppressed by the UN because clearly they were looking for him and clearly the UN weren't the ones who destroyed the ship. So well, that should actually make Marka look bad, but I guess maybe spinning the story to make him look like the hero, which makes sense. But, you know, where's the anti-spin? Uh, I guess Fred Johnson and Dolls don't have a very good uh, propaganda team where they can spin this back their way. But anyway, that's probably the bigger war that no one's discussing. The media war, which is always uh, very important as well. But anyway, um, is Drummer really resigned? I don't know. I guess so. Uh, I wonder what they're going to do with her character. I'm kind of hoping that she'll go back to Captain uh, Medina Station because maybe that's how the season won. I don't know. Uh, that's where I think she should be. I don't know. But anyway, Ashford is going off uh, to try to kill Marco and Aris. Now, I 
this is totally off books. Like Ashford's not in this part of the books. I know nothing from the books of what will happen to him. Uh, and I haven't seen the last two episodes of the season. As I said, I'm just recording after just watching this episode. But I'm going to predict that Ashford dies. Just my prediction. Maybe not because they do like this character. And he brings a nice dynamic working with Drummer. But then again... Uh, yeah, it would be kind of powerful to kill him off. And plus, like once Naomi and all of them are back in the soul system, it seems like Drummer can just play off them. It seems like that's the main reason why they kept Ashford in Season 4, so Drummer would have someone to play off of. And they do make an, an interesting pair, and I think that moment where she brought on the... The, the, the alcohol was a really touching moment, of course, calling back to season three when uh, he was offering her alcohol and uh, he's telling her. Also, this should actually be the biggest tell that he's going to die. The fact that he says, gives the alcohol back to her and is like, we'll drink it when I get back. Whenever a character says that to another character and they have this touching moment, it's like, oh, we don't need to do this now. We'll worry about this when they get back. They're not coming back. <laughs> And again, this isn't a spoiler. I don't know this. This is total speculation on my part. But come on, I think it's, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, <laughs> he, that he's going to die. But you know, that's, I could be wrong. It's just a guess. But anyway, um, yeah, I think that's I think that's about it. Uh, that we oh Bobby Draper. Gotta talk a bit about Bobby Draper before I go. Uh, so there's a job that that's really shady guy who's a dickhead to her. Um, like he comes up with another job, and she was right, and she was like, "Oh, well, your codes work this time," and he's like, "Fuck you!" But she has a point. <laughs> His fucking codes didn't work last time, and I think Bobby is a very right not to trust him. And this, there's a huge payday, but Bobby's like, well, what's was the deal? What are we doing? And they're like, oh, well, we don't need to know this for this much money. And she's like, well, bullshit, I need to know. And it's interesting that she actually goes to uh, what, whatever the hell his name is, Ellis, the cop dude. Uh, <laughs> S-I, or S-E-C, or S-E, whatever his name is. Anyway, he goes to him. And finds out he has a family. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had a family. And she's like, well, why would you? <laughs> which, is, which is really interesting. And then we get this really interesting conversation between them where he sort of reveals, and I kind of touched on this later, I mean earlier, um, that uh, Mars is going to go to shit. And that's kind of been hinting at throughout the season that with, you know, all the unemployment and everything like that, and he sort of spells it out. With these ring gates, you know, why is everyone going to waste time terraforming? Every, the terraform project's going to fall apart. Mars is going to fall apart uh, with the ring gates as a feature because why spend centuries uh, making a dead planet into a living, breathable planet when there's tons, that literally thousands of livable planets just out there sitting there waiting. Uh, which is uh, a very good point, actually. <laughs> so, and he, so that's what we learned. That's his huge motivation for taking this job and getting the money. But uh, Bobby is obviously very dubious about the job. It's, it sounds very shady, and you know, she's like tells him rightfully, like that all that money won't make any difference if you're dead, which is true. Um, but he says, oh, you can drip back out if you want. So I don't know if he will. I kind of think she won't just because we need to see it on the screen. Um, but you know that, uh, it's not going to end well for him. Uh, that's another thing I'm predicting right now. Is, uh, again, where he's like, I'm going to live with my family. We're going to live happily ever after. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> something bad's going to happen to him. Uh, if he doesn't die, then it's going to be something bad. But, uh, I don't know. Just had to see. And then, of course, there's Bobby's boyfriend, where he gets a job on Europa, and she gets pissed at him, yells at him, tells him to leave, because at first when he was like, oh, I'm applying for this job, is that right? She's like, yeah, sure, whatever, it doesn't matter. Next time, you know, when she tells him, she's like, oh, fuck you, get out of here. <laughs> but it's kind of understandable, because she had just learned about the fact that Mars is falling apart because everyone's leaving. And here's another Martian saying, I am leaving because there's nothing here for me. And I can see how that hits home to her. Uh, it makes her a bit upset. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't really see this relationship being that long-term personally, but 
we'll see. Anyway, uh, my rating for The One-Eyed Man out of 10, I'm going to give this episode an 8. Uh, extremely good. I'll almost give it a 9 uh, because I think the, the uh, Avasarala stuff is really powerful. But then some of the story seems, the Bobby story maybe drags a bit. But it's still a really good episode. It's a really solid entry, as always. Uh, really powerful, really great seeing Drummer Punch Fred Johnson and uh, getting the resolution to the death slugs uh, <laughs> and curing the blindness. Uh, really good stuff. A really great season so far. I, I really have no complaints. So anyway, that is it for my review of The One-Eyed Man. I will be back in a couple days for my book to show comparison. And in a week from now, cover episode 9 of The Expanse. So be sure to check out my channel uh, as I cover The Expanse. And as I cover other shows like Star Trek, Picard, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all that. Thanks a lot for watching.